Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are getting started here. I think Megan's <clears throat> Megan is getting online. So just give us a couple more minutes and we'll get the meeting started. Thanks for joining this morning. Hey folks, we'll get, uh, hopefully get folks to join now that we've got the link, Zoom link working. Hi, Tracy. Hi everyone, thanks for your patience. Sorry about the, the uh, technical difficulties. Give it a couple minutes and let people um, rejoin. Megan, I'll jump over to the um, that Google link and just see if there's anybody over there. It looks like um, Brian might have ended up over there. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I've got a a bunch of people. Okay, we have a few other uh, people who are jumping over, including it looks like Russ is here. Um, so that's great. So I think we can go ahead and get started again. Apologies, everyone, for the confusion this morning. <clears throat> um, I wanted to let everybody know that starting next month, hopefully we won't have this confusion. We are excited to announce that we'll be um, reconvening in a hybrid format. So for those of us who can join in person, we'll be meeting um, <clears throat> where the meetings were held before COVID at the um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife headquarters. Um, and we'll send out in-person information for that meeting. It will also be available um, to join remotely. So you can feel free to um, continue to, to join remotely, or we hope to see as many of you in person as we can starting next month. <clears throat> and um, I'm also, I also wanted to let everybody know that um, previously the meeting summaries for this meeting were titled um, drought summaries. Um, starting last month, I retitled those summaries as the water availability summaries um, to more adequately match the name of this meeting. Um, please let me know if you have any concerns or questions about that change in the summary. Otherwise, they're still available online after the meeting on the same website. So I think without further ado, we can hand it over to Russ, who can tell us all about the snowstorm headed our way. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, you got to let me share my screen. Okay. Thank you, the presenter here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Great. Thanks, Russ. 
All right. Um, okay. You see that okay? Yep, we got it. All right. All right. Well, um, I guess it's a it's a good day to be having this meeting because there's a whole lot going on that we'll try to to walk through. And uh, feel free to stop me if you have any questions as as we go along, since there's uh, plenty to report. So we'll look back um, first. Our kind of usual look back through the water year up to this point. Um, this photo here was from uh, Jeff Derry's. Uh, just on snow update from the picture was taken on May 8th, apparently, but that's a, a pretty, pretty rough looking picture there um, near Overpass, which is uh, west of Silverton. Um, so April seems like a long time ago now, um, as we're in the, you know, getting into late May, but we'll go back and, and uh, review what happened in April because it does set the stage a bit for what we're seeing now. Um, so Here's the national map of, of temperature uh, from April. See kind of the, the typical La Nina pattern of, of warm across the southern tier and cold across the northern tier and Colorado about in the middle. Um, so we were had a had, statewide had near near average temperatures in April, but you can see kind of the rundown of the water year on the right, where the fall was was very warm, especially November and December. Um, and then we've been more in the, the near average range for the last couple of months. Um, so statewide for the water year through the end of April, tied for the 13th warmest. Um, so well above average there, both above the, well above the 20th century average and, and a bit above the more recent average for the first seven months of the water year. And here's similar for precipitation. We'll zoom in on Colorado in a second. Um, so April was very dry uh, here in Colorado, if we remember back to that. Uh, fifth driest statewide with many areas record dry, as I'll show in a second. Um, and so for the water year as a whole, uh, 39th driest first seven months of the of the water year. Um, but this varies a bit of depending on where you are in the state, uh, of course, as well. Um, so if we zoom in on Colorado here, here are similar maps. Um, this is for just April for temperature. Um, so on these maps, what we'll see is if you see the, the white color would be in the kind of in the middle of the pack in terms of years historically. Um, if you see reds, uh, you know, up to the darkest reds, this is percent basically percentile ranks. Um, and then similarly for the blues. So April, most of Colorado kind of in the middle of the pack temperature wise, but some spots in Southern Colorado that were warm, especially um, down in Southwest Colorado. So statewide 49th warmest or 80th coldest, if you want to look at it that way. Um, and then for the water year as a whole through April, as I mentioned, 13th warmest. So it's still, still pretty warm. Um, period and some spots in the top 10 warmest uh, you see kind of the you know just east of the the Denver metro area and down there and then parts of the San Luis Valley and, and southwest Colorado as well in the the top 10 warm October through April periods and then if we look at precipitation for Colorado we'll look at this in a few different ways this is uh, eight, just April percent of normal um, Basically, everywhere east of the divide was very, very dry in April. Um, and uh, so, you know, some spots with a couple pixels on the map in here with with zero percent of normal with no precipitation in April. Um, Northern mountains, not quite so bad in the in the normal range, like up in the park range. Um, and then parts of southwest Colorado were quite dry in April as well. And here's how that shapes up. In a, from a ranking perspective. So everywhere here in this darkest brown color, it was the driest uh, driest April on record. And so you can see this, you know, pretty big swath of, um, of Northeastern Colorado um, was very dry. And then as you go into Southeast Colorado, it wasn't record dry, but it was in the top 10 uh, driest Aprils. So that really sets the stage for, for where we're at now. And we'll kind of look also at, at to break this down a little bit as we go here. Again, parts of the northern mountains near northern mountains near to a little bit above average for precipitation in April, and southwest Colorado uh, quite dry 
also. Um, and then this is for the water year as a whole. This is percent of average. Um, again, we see, so the green colors here are in the average range or even a bit above average. So we see a lot of, of Western Colorado kind of in the normal range for the October through April period. Um, and much of Eastern Colorado dry, um, especially as we get down into the, to the Southeast corner. And here's how that looks from a ranking perspective. Again, similar story, much of, of Western Colorado um, doing okay over this, this seven month period, uh, but some spots dry and most of Eastern Colorado uh, drier than average over, over this time period. And so um, for the, the seven, the first seven months of the water year, 21st driest um, statewide, I think it's a tie with a few other years um, in, in there. Okay. So April was dry, um, but I think the real story with, with, with April was how windy it was. Um, it was, uh, you know, just in a lot of places, just relentless winds the whole month, not too many, you know, extreme wind gusts, like not, not like record level magnitude of the wind, but just, just nonstop wind through the month. Um, so we analyzed this a bit for, this is for the Coagment network. You know, one trouble with analyzing wind is we don't have data going back, you know, 100, 100 years or, you know, like that, like we do for temperature and precipitation. But most of these stations have been there since like the early to mid 90s. And so this is the rank of, of the windiness in April for wind run. So wind run is basically, you know, you think of wind in miles per hour and then you uh, multiply it by the time and look at how many miles of wind uh, there were. Um, so we see a lot of places in Northeast Colorado had the windiest April, at least since these stations were installed in the in the early early to mid 1990s. Um, so yeah, quite a few places with the windiest April. You know, if it like here in Fort Collins, only the third windiest over this period. Um, not quite as extreme in uh, Southern Colorado, center second windiest. Um, Southeast Colorado, you know, again, not not in the not as extreme, but still uh, still quite windy through those areas. So April is the windiest month on average across most of the eastern plains, um, and and so this was just kind of taking that to uh, a new level, um, and you know, lots of days with strong winds. Um, these numbers might be hard to see depending on how big your screen is, but this is the the number of days that had a gust. Uh, over 40 miles per hour if we adjust. So most of our anemometers are only at two or three meters above ground. If we kind of do the adjustment to what that would be if they were at 10 meters, um, you know, a lot of stations with 15, 18, 20 uh, days with, with 40 mile an hour winds in April. Um, and then the result of that is, right, so the conditions for evaporative demand are sun, and humidity, lack of humidity, um, temperature, and wind. And so the kind of the combination of all of that in April led to many of these stations having their either their top or top few um, potential evapotranspiration. So basically evaporative demand uh, uh, rankings for, for April, um, especially pretty much across the most of the Eastern Plains. Um, so we'll kind of see the effects of that as we as we go through here that um, not only was there a lack of precipitation, but there was not very many cloudy days and lots and lots of wind. Um, and that has really dried things out quickly um, across much of eastern Colorado. Um, to sum up where we're at with the water year so far through April. Um, Here's our, our quadrant chart. So as a reminder on these, upper left is warm and dry, the drought quadrant. Upper right is warm and wet, cool and wet in the lower right, cool and dry in the lower left. With the average precipitation in the gray line vertically here, the recent average temperature in the gray line like the last 30 years there. And so we see 2022 water year through April up here in the warm and dry quadrant. Um, so even though we had a pretty good winter in some spots in the like January, February time period um, for the water year as a whole, we're still up here in the warm and dry. Um, 
right next to 1954 and 2012, which are not good years to be close to, um, but obviously not as extreme as, as 2018 or 1934 um, through, through uh, April. And we'll look at at least what we know about May so far here uh, now. So yeah, we're you know two thirds of the way through May now. Um, here's what temperature looks like across the state. Um, most of the state has been warmer than average for May, and that's especially true the farther south you go. The one exception is up in Northwest Colorado has not been you know it's kind of near average. Uh, up there, but pretty much everywhere else has been warm and see some spots in southern Colorado in the, you know, more than six degrees above average uh, for May through, uh, well, through the 17th. And yesterday was a very warm day. So, so this, you know, this might be a little bit higher if we included yesterday in there as well. Um, months to date precipitation. Um, Northeast Colorado had the great uh, steady rainstorm on the first few days of the month. Uh, that brought you know widespread one inch plus to the northeast corner and some spots like out near Burlington where they had over two inches of rain um, from that storm and a couple others in the meantime. So that was very welcome and uh, really beneficial in those areas. But not everyone got that rain. You can see the San Luis Valley has had nothing in May so far. Um, down into Southwest Colorado, nothing so far in May. Southeast Colorado had um, some decent rain a couple of days after when, when the rain happened in Northeast Colorado that was kind of a widespread half inch type event, um, which again, welcome, but not, uh, not that much uh, really in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and here's just another way of, of looking at that at, at specific points. This is from, our, from the Coagnet network. Um, rainfall totals up to, well, through the 15th of May, um, but there hasn't really been much, except for a few spots out on the plains, got some rain yesterday from thunderstorms, but it was pretty spotty. Um, so you can see Northeast corner, a good inch plus in most places, Southeast Colorado, mostly in the half, you know, half inch range, and then nothing in the San Luis Valley or, or Southwest Colorado uh, for the month so far, and, and decent precipitation up in the in North Park and, and Middle Park uh, there as well. Um, I won't spend too much time on these, just to, I wanted to show just a couple of time scales here of the standardized precipitation index. So this is, you know, as we usually show these, if you see the greens and blues, it's, it's uh, wetter than average for that location, kind of unusually wet. If you see the oranges and reds, it's unusually dry. If you see a gray dot, it's, it's you know, kind of in the normal range. So this is for the last two months. Um, as you, you may remember, early March, we still had some good snowstorms and then, and, and then things kind of stopped after that point. And that's when, when it's turned really dry. So you can see in the last two months, a lot of places with, um, you know, with, with dry conditions, especially, you know, front range, um, into parts of Eastern Colorado, um, and then similarly down, uh, you know, to, so the Western Slope down into the San Luis Valley, um, quite dry over that, uh, over the last two months. And if we went down like into New Mexico and Texas, it looks, it looks even worse down there. Um, and then this is for the water year as a whole. So going back to October, and it looks kind of similar to, to what we've seen in the other maps. Um, near average over that time period for much of um, Western Colorado, or at least the, the Northwestern part of Colorado, um, dry the farther south you go and, and most places east of the divide being dry for the for the water year um, through yesterday. All right, so we'll take our little tour around some of our long term stations going uh, counterclockwise and we'll just kind of flip through some of these graphs to see where we're at um, there. And so if if you haven't seen these graphs in a while, what they show is the, the water year precipitation for this year so far in the black line. Um, the long-term average in the gray dashed line. And then from this point forward, all of the historical years um, in these light gray lines. And so, you know, all the kind of the range of variability we might see going forward. And then sort of a, um, you know, a middle of the road uh, picture of that in the green dashed and, and a little above in the purple and, and then below, uh, you know, if we were to see above or below going forward. 
um, in the orange line and the, and the purple there. So anyway, so we'll start at Grand Lake, 71% uh, of average precipitation for the water year so far. And a lot of the, a lot of the Western Colorado or, you know, and mountain uh, stations have traces that look like this, where it was very, very dry in the fall, um, huge storms, late December, early January, that brought things back, at least here at Grand Lake, right back up to the, to the average. And then not much precipitation through most of the, you know, much of the winter. Um, and then here, the, the, that early May storm shows up nicely, but still well below average for the water year. Um, again, you know, about a th little over three inches uh, below average for this point in the water year. Um, if we go to Grand Junction, this is one of the places that's, that's uh, right near average. Um, now it's dipped a little bit below dryness the last couple of weeks, but 91% of average, that's pretty close to um, where things should be at this time in the water year. Uh, then going south to Montrose, um, it looks quite a bit worse there, and this is this is a spot that did not benefit from some as much from some of those storms in the in the winter and spring, um, like Delta Montrose County um, didn't get as much as as up in the Grand Junction area. So this date only goes through the end of April, but they haven't really they've only had a few hundredths of of rain most likely in May so far. So only you know fifty six percent of average there, and that's probably a little worse if we took that out to um, to today. And similar story at Mesa Verde in Southwest Colorado. Again, you can see the big storms in, in December there, and then just not, not that much since then. And then really nothing um, you know, since early April, 69% uh, of the long-term average there. Alamosa, similarly um, quite dry. Uh, and it's been like most other places, very windy in the, in the San Luis Valley in April and, and in, in parts of May so far. If we go up to Pueblo, um, a little bit better than some of those other locations, 72% of average, but still um, not great there. Um, and then we go to the Southeast corner in Walsh, and this is uh, where conditions are, are probably the worst in the state is down in, in Baca County. Um, you know, the winter, the fall and winter, it's not really the wet season there anyway, um, but even compared to that, very, very dry, only 42% of the average, uh, the water year average so far, um, and, you know, extremely windy uh, down there as well. Um, but we're going into the, to the wet season there, at least historically. Um, so, you know, it's possible that those deficits could be made up quickly with a wet monsoon season as we get into July and August. We'll just have to wait and see what happens there. But current current conditions are not um, not looking good in that part of the state. Burlington uh, looks a bit better. Um, Eighty four percent of average. They had good good rain from that storm in early May. They also had that that sort of freak snow band that uh, brought them you know over a foot of snow back in late January, but that only affected a, a narrow uh, swath. So at Burlington, you know, but still below average, but um, not as bad as some other spots. Uh, over to Akron, seventy two percent of average. Um, again, there's that nice storm in early May, but nothing since then um, over there. Um, and then if we go to Boulder, there's there's one day in May that, that is missing data. So this should be a little bit higher um, from that May storm, maybe another inch in there, but it's still, you know, that even if we added an inch to that and made that 7.59, that's still about four inches below average for the water year. Um, and so quite, quite dry conditions. Um, here along the front range as well. Um, you know, and again, we see that same pattern, extremely dry fall. Uh, Boulder had a ton of snow for, for February and March, Jan like January through March, they had one of their snowiest uh, January through March periods um, that they've ever had, but then uh, nothing since then, uh, at least until we see what happens this week. Um, so yeah, conditions dried out very quickly there. Um, and then um, Brian or Carl, I'm not sure who's presenting, they'll go into all the snowpack numbers, but 
Um, but that's kind of the other big part of the story here. I, I, I think we have to have to mention it at least, and then we'll give a little bit of teaser for what they um, dive into as far as that goes. Is the the rate of the snowfall, the snowpack loss, especially in the southern basins. Um, so the so what what these what these tables show here basically is is what I did was looked for the the biggest drop in snow water equivalent at these snow tail stations prior to May 15th um, in the, all historical years. And so you can see in the in the San Juans especially, um, so there's Middle Creek, Upper San Juan, Wolf Creek Summit, um, they all had, have had their largest 30 day drop in, in SWE for this time of the season. Um, and the and and standing you know a, a quite a bit above any of the other years, especially at Wolf Creek Summit. So that's that's an inch per day for 30 days. Um, and the snowback is lost also farther north, and and we'll see all of that when we get to the NRCS pr presentation. Um, so not certainly not as extreme as you go to the northern basins, um, but but quite remarkable in in. Uh, in the San Juans, especially, and so we, when we kind of looked at this too, so so this rate of snow melt is, in an absolute sense, is not that huge. Um, so the way that you get really uh, fast snow melt is to hold on to a lot of snowpack into June. So you're like 2019 when there was a ton of snow left in June, and then you get a warm period in June when the sun is, you know, at at the solstice, and you can melt off snow really fast. Um, but, but that is not as common in May because the sun angle is not as high. Um, so I think these numbers reflect that there was quite a bit of snow at these stations as of you know early April. Um, so it wasn't a year where there just wasn't snow, it just didn't snow. Um, but then it's it's gone pretty quickly. And we can see that in the in the stream flow trace at, for example, for the Rio Grande um, near Del Norte. And so this is the, the average in these gray bars and then this year in the blue. Um, and so that almost certainly is the peak for the year on May 8th, which is actually higher than the average peak, um, but about a month early. And um, you know, so by the time we get to, to the normal peak in June, I'm guessing with not much snow up on the, on the hills anymore, there, that is gonna be way, way, way below average um, uh, by the time we get to there. So, the the optimistic view of this is well hey at least the water was there um, but the pessimistic view is uh, it's not going to be there at the time when when uh, it's expected to be there all right so let's take a look kind of more closely at some of the drought conditions um, here's the in situ measurement from the Bear Lake Snowtel this week we had our um, our annual Kokoraz meeting up in Estes Park and we went up to to Bear Lake and and walked over to the Snowtel so uh we didn't actually try to take a measurement don't worry brian carl we didn't go walk out there on the pillow um but uh the, the reading uh, the the reading at that point was 63 percent of normal and there's the there's the snow on the on the pillow and some of the folks who were attending the conference there um all right so here's the fresh new drought monitor released this morning um very ugly picture in the southern plains down into New Mexico and Texas and really the west as a whole is not not looking great um, as as we sort of know and some places have, have gotten worse and if we look at Colorado specifically um, we're now up to so we saw a broad expansion of the D3 or extreme drought category into southeastern Colorado and into the San Luis Valley so we're now up to about 23% of the state in the D3 category, um, up from only about 6% uh, last week. And that's really, yeah, it's this area here and, and most of the, the valley there. So um, conditions have worsened quite rapidly in Southeast Colorado with the lack of rain and the wind and the sunshine um, and, and very uh, not humid conditions there. Um, this is the change map over the last two months, and we sort of see that reflected a couple of spots with um, with a three class degradation uh, here, like in Elbert County, um, and and you know much of the the you know from the northern Colorado out onto the eastern plains, and some other two category degradations there as well. So this this reflects that 
um, the transition from you know a decent January, February, early March to very uh, dry conditions the last couple of months. Um, and this really stands out when looking at something like evaporative demand. This is Eddy evaporative demand drought index for the last month, um, and basically record levels across much of the state and much of the, the southwestern U.S. for that matter. Um, so this again, sun, wind, uh, low humidity, uh, no precipitation. Um, yeah, has dried things out very quickly. And if we go back to the last two months, um, similar picture, especially Southeast Colorado at, at basically record levels of, of evaporative demand for you know, late March through mid-May, um, similar in the Valley and again, much of the, the Southwestern US. Uh, so, you know, of course, one thing that that, in addition to drought, one thing that that certainly comes to mind is is the potential for fires. This is the USDA outlook that was issued at the beginning of May, showing in, in above normal chances for um, significant fires in June. Uh, if we look at July and August, they're somewhat similar, although the 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 the, the red boxes shift kind of to the east in in that um, time frame, I'm not going to show them all here, but but certainly we know what's happening in New Mexico now. We've had quite a few fires, although no huge ones in Colorado uh, up to this point. Um, so yeah, that, I think that risk is is going to continue, barring some some big changes, at least in in some spots. Um, soil moisture looks pretty bad, and we've heard from from folks, especially on the Eastern Plains of, of how dry the soils are. Um, and if we look at the, so this on the right here is the deeper soil moisture, the top meter. Uh, so again, Baca County, parts of, of you know, Elbert, El Paso, Lincoln counties, parts of, of Weld up into the Northeast, San Luis Valley um, are places where the soils have really dried out. And, and this was, this is about a week old. Uh, this map, so I think it would probably look even worse if we had it through today with the additional uh, warm and, and dry conditions over the last week. Um, so not not looking great there. Um, and that shows up similarly in in veg dry and quick dry, which try to estimate the vegetation condition. Veg dry sort of on the longer term, quick dry on the shorter term. Um, the the gray areas here are where there's still snow. Um, but everywhere else, you can see the vegetation, except for Northwest Colorado, everywhere else is, is uh, you know, vegetation is not doing well. And I'm sure that, you know, we all kind of have seen that uh, uh, outside or, or uh, driving around or whatever uh, across the state. And just one other thing, a condition monitoring reports. Um, so this is the Kokoraz condition monitoring with the drought monitor there. Um, and you can see, you know, quite a few reports. San Luis Valley severe drought. People are reporting um, this one down here. They entered near normal, but if you read the text, it, it, they're not describing near normal um, in the in the Durango area. Uh, it's, it's worse than that. Um, so this is one from this spot near Del Norte. Um, just you know, the narrative can be kind of helpful here. Uh, farmers are being forced to apply more water because of the high ET rates. Uh, perpetual fire watch in the valley. Rio Grande peaked about three weeks early. Surface irrigation will be severely impacted early this summer. So um, these are the kinds of concerns that that we've been hearing about, and I'm sure many of you have as well. All right. So up to this point, everything sounds very bleak and uh, and terrible, um, and I think that it, and that is true. But at least we have some positive news here in the outlook. Um, going forward. So there's our seven day precipitation map. Um, and that sure looks like a like a quite nice picture, uh, at least for some parts of the state. Um, so we, as I'm sure everyone's heard, we have this, it's going to be very warm and dry again today, and then very strong cold front tonight. And uh, definitely snow in the mountains, probably some snow down at the lower elevations, and a good amount of moisture um, across the, the northern and, and central mountain areas. Um, so like the purple contour on here is two inches. Um, so, you know, that and then getting up to, you know, a peak of three, a lot of the, the front range and, and 
adjacent planes over an inch, inch and a half. So um, that and that would all be coming basically Friday into Saturday, uh, tomorrow into Saturday. So some good news there. And if we look at that as a as a percent of or a, a compared to the average conditions for the area, again, very nice to see um, greens on this map, which we haven't been seeing any of lately. Um, so some, you know, spots here where, you know, maybe up to two inches above the average for a week in May. Um, but the areas that are, are sort of hardest hit by drought right now, Southeast Colorado, growing concerns in, in Southwest Colorado will probably not get much out of this storm. And so the areas that are already not doing so badly, like the Northern mountains will be the ones that benefit the most here. Um, you know, this forecast could shift, but but it does not look like it's going to be a great benefit to to southeast or southwest Colorado, unfortunately. Um, and here's the the snow forecast from this morning in terms of of snow amounts. Um, so probably a good you know two feet uh, for the high elevations uh, through the you know Larimer Boulder County down into into you know Clear Creek Summit, um, and then. Denver Metro, every foot of elevation is going to matter in this storm. Uh, you know, there could be a very sharp gradient between like Denver City and the west suburbs where the slightly higher elevations there could be get quite a lot more. Uh, similarly, like West Boulder or western side of Fort Collins may get may get substantially more than the east side there. So uh, so we'll see, but that's uh, that's uh, what we've got coming. Um, Snow in May is not that unusual. Um, as we get this late in May, it's a little bit less common. Um, but just as you know, one point of comparison, maybe people remember this storm from basically exactly five years ago. These are the snow totals in that storm, uh, four to six to eight inches along the lower elevations in the, the urban corridor, but a good three feet uh, up in, in the mountains. So you know, we may be seeing something a little bit like that in this uh, approaching storm. So here's, here's what that looks like in terms of the temperature and then in the longer range output. This is for Denver. Again, very warm today. And then it is gonna plummet tonight. The temperature uh, probably freezes, maybe a freeze on Saturday morning, very likely a freeze on Sunday morning. So, you know, gardeners, et cetera, um, uh, you know, try to prepare for that, I guess, the best you can. Uh, but then with a warm up and then looking like we go back to warm and dry. So this is not going to be a, a long lasting wet pattern. It's going to be this this blast for a few days of cold and wet and then back to warm and dry after that. Um, and this for precipitation, we sort of see that all the precipitation that's going to happen is going to happen Friday, Saturday, and then looking dry, a dry pattern again after that. We see that in the CPC eight to 14 day outlook. So this is for May 26th through June 1st, back to warm and dry, above normal temperatures, below normal precipitation. Um, so again, not a prolonged uh, wet pattern shift here, unfortunately, but it will be good moisture uh, while we get it. And then looking farther out, um, we continue to be in La Nina conditions. It's a pretty strong La Nina for this, for the spring. Um, Unfortunately, the out the 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 ENSO outlooks are are leaning towards staying in La Nina through the summer and perhaps all the way into next fall and next winter, which is not what we would like to see. La Nina's, you know, again, anything can happen, but La Nina's, you know, on average tend to be drier for us here in Colorado, um, and as, especially outside of the winter season. So this is a map that, that I think we showed something similar last month, but this is the map that, that Peter made um, for basically the correlation between El Nino, La Nina and precipitation in Colorado. So if you see reds, it's where El Nino is wetter. If you see blues, it's where La Nina is wetter. Um, so especially what we see is summer and fall during La Nina is dry, uh, you know, on average. Um, the winter can be wetter during La Nina um but but especially you know all the other seasons tend to be dry which is um not great and so if we do have that uh triple dri triple dip la nina um you know i think that it, it, it doesn't rule out a wet year but it uh makes it less likely 
I'm just going to skip over that one. So here's what the June, this, so this was just released this morning um, from the Climate Prediction Center, the outlooks out uh, uh, through the summer. And so this is for temperature. Uh, and again, look at this like a confidence forecast. Um, so the, the, the darker the colors, the more confident the forecast is in, in it being that in this case above normal temperature. So if you look at the pie chart, I put a the dot at Grand Junction there. Um, again, if you were throwing darts at the dartboard, you'd get 33, 33, 33 for above, near, and below normal. Um, the below normal piece of the pie is basically gone here. So, so they're saying there's really no chance of a, of a cool summer um, and a very increased chance of an above normal temperature uh, summer. And you can see that same category extends across uh, all of, pretty much all of Colorado and, and much of the West. Precipitation, the signal is much less uh, clear. Some hints maybe of a of an active monsoon in, in um, Arizona, New Mexico, that maybe that'll extend up into Colorado, you know, slightly tilted towards drier than average conditions out over the Eastern Plains, but this is not, uh, so precipitation outlooks for the summer are just really hard and not very, you know, the, the skill is not that high. So you can see it's not, um, not a high confidence there. But of course, if it's above normal temperature, then that puts more stress on water, even if the precipitation is, is near average. So takeaways, significant uh, worsening of drought conditions since mid-March, especially on the Eastern Plains with the dryness and no precipitation, wind, no clouds, low humidity. Um, we had that nice storm in early May, but most of those benefits are gone. Um, so as of today, conditions are, are quite bad uh, most places. The good news, at least in the near term, is we've got this big storm coming in. It looks wet. Um, northern Colorado, uh, both mountains and plains, should get a good you know, storm of rain and snow, depending on where you are. Um, but the southern part of the state that needs the precipitation the most is not going to benefit as much um, from this storm. Summer outlook looks warm, um, and the longer range outlook shows this this the chance for this triple dip La Nina, which would not be uh, good news. Again, it's not a it's not a guarantee of anything, but um, but it does you know La Nina years tend to be dry more often than not. So I uh, will stop there. There's my contact. Um, remember, we do our monthly webinars usually on the second Tuesday of the month. So it'll be second Tuesday of June will be the next one. Um, you can also subscribe to get our monthly summaries uh, in the email and I'll quit. Happy to take questions. I don't know if there were any in the chat because I didn't see it. Great, thanks so much, Russ. No, I don't see any questions in the chat right now, but um, does anybody have quick questions for Russ? Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, and then Brian. Yep. I think you are morning. on. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Do you, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find your name here in the participant list to make sure to give you co-hosting. Here we go. Okay, yeah. so you should be able to share your screen now. Um, let's see, did my... Okay, let me... Um... All right, there we go. Let's see. If anyone has questions for Russ or Brian, feel free to put them in the chat and we can address them. Um, after Brian's presentation today, I'm excited to welcome um, some colleagues who will be giving a presentation on a cool program going on in Colorado um, uh, based on airborne snow observatory observations. Um, so we're excited to have that presentation coming up. Sorry, I'm not sure what's going on. For some reason, it's not giving me the option to. Oh. 
to share. share PowerPoint. Let me see if I can't just start it um, from the first slide and maybe it'll show up. Hmm. Today is just not a day for technology. <laughs> Feel free to email it to me, Brian. I can try to share it from my screen. Sure. Is is it showing up right now? No, I'm not seeing it. Hmm. Are you on Very two monitors, Brian? I see you looking at another monitor. Zoom does not like yeah. that when you have two monitors up. <laughs> I have experience. three. Does that make it monitors. guaranteed impossible? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, oh, boy. All right. Yeah, maybe I'll have to send it to you. Unfortunately, it is a big... Ah, there we go. It was hiding. OK, but go. I think it's showing presenter screen. Is that correct or no? We have it in edit screen right now, but we can certainly see the slides. All right, let's try that. There we go. Yep. Perfect. Thanks. OK, yeah, likewise. Excuse me one second while I clear my throat. Speaking of uh, things not going uh, well, uh, although we got it working here on the presentation, um, we have planned a, a summer kickoff party for Saturday of this weekend. Um, and I find it uh, very timely that this big storm is coming in with a whole bunch of snow. Um, so I think I'm going to try and plan um, summer kickoff neighborhood parties for every weekend for the rest of the summer in an effort to try and get it to um, snow and precip for the rest of the year. We'll see how that effort goes. Uh, all right, so I uh, tried to switch up the format of, of today's presentation a little bit um, from the, the typical uh, presentation where we go basin to basin. And actually, I meant to remove this slide, but I did not. So I guess it's a teaser for the presentation that we typically give. Uh, instead of going around the state um, geographically, um, looking to go through it uh, more on a um, uh, an element or you know a sensor parameter type basis so we'll start off here with soil moisture i took this picture a few years ago um, uh, from um, crested butte ski area uh, when it was very dry one december so that's why i put it in the soil moisture um, in the soil moisture slot there. Sorry, it's not a picture of actual soils or, or a sensor or anything, but I just thought I'd highlight a, a few of um, some newer graphs that we're kind of putting out here. Um, and I'm assuming you can see my mouse. Um, so these graphs are a little bit newer using data from our soil moisture sensors that we have at about 45 sites uh, throughout the state of Colorado here. Um, and they key off of the entire soil moisture sensor stack that we have at these 45 sites. Uh, and the data still needs a fair amount of love, uh, some QA, QC to really clean it up. But uh, these preliminary products do generally reflect the conditions that we're seeing. Um, and what I like to point out here is, you know, through much of the fall and winter, soil moisture uh, across all of our sites in the state, you know, is running low, it's running below normal. Um, and then through the, the wet up period through Colorado, you know, things uh, tend to start tracking a little bit more, no, more normal. And what I do to kind of give me an idea of um, the idea that that's, uh, they, they, it typically tracks upward is because, of course, you know, you see the minimum here is definitely going up. You don't ever see um, values that, you know, track into this area and, and the fact that it is, you know, most of the soils when the snow is melting become wet or almost entirely saturated. Um, and, and the bounds here are, are more narrow, say, than the bounds here, right? And you can see how we're, we're typically tracking relatively low. So that's what we're looking at uh, for these next uh, three graphs, including this one. You can see soil moisture uh, as of yesterday is very near normal. Um, and, and uh, but it's kind of forced to be because uh, snowpack is melting. Um, here in the upper Rio Grande, I, did, I just picked a few uh, basins around the state to kind of give an idea of uh, the normal with uh, the previous graph, the uh, state of Colorado, the entire state of Colorado. And then here's the Rio Grande where I saw some of the, the poorest conditions. And then we'll look at another basin here in just a little bit that shows some of the best conditions, at least from what the sensors are showing. Um, and here in the Rio Grande, again, you know, tracking extremely dry um, it, near that bottom 10th percentile through much of the winter, pretty dry um, into the fall. Um, 
and then even here uh, in in the the spring, as things are wetting up, uh, it is indicating some dry conditions. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our soil moisture data needs some QAQC. I, I'm not 100% uh, in entire belief uh, of these numbers, and when we do get that cleaned up in the future, uh, I um, I think we'll have some better values here. However, I do think that this is a pretty good indicator of the fact that. Soil moisture is quite dry uh, in the Rio Grande, as we saw from some of those uh, maps from, from Russ there. And then kind of going to the other uh, side of the state, the other extreme, you know, looking here in the, the Colorado headwaters, it is showing that uh, so, uh, soil moisture is doing pretty well in the headwaters of the Colorado. Um, you know, near near maximum again, uh, this area, the, the data needs to be cleaned up a, a little bit, but we are showing that, that things are wetting up. Um, pretty well uh, and may you know the reason this may be happening is as again russ mentioned it i'll get into it here in a little bit uh snowpack is melting off a little bit earlier or a good bit earlier than normal in different parts of the state we'll look at that here in a little bit so we might be getting some of this effect here you know uh, just because it's earlier we are seeing those the, the snow melting earlier if we transitioned this uh whole range here back here we'd be more within the realm of normal but nonetheless uh soil moisture is wetting up because because of the um, snow melt right now. So here, uh, just kind of recaps what I was just talking about. Uh, soil moisture uh, data is still very new. We've got a QA, QC it. Um, but the, the real point to highlight here is the fact that the soil moisture was below normal much of the winter and in the spring and in the summer of last year, which was not uh, very evident on this, this graph here. Um, but what we really want to watch for is what that soil moisture does uh, once we get on the recession side. So here, I'll go back to this graph. I'll actually go yeah, we'll leave it here. You know, as as we start to to trend downward, right? Um, if if we start getting here, kind of ex on the extreme end of the dry side early on, that's what we want to be watching out for as those soils get really thirsty. Um, and uh, you know, any future precipitation we get is will be uh, soaked up by by the soils. Okay, uh, stream flow. Um, I, I decided uh, to show Streamflow from two uh, different viewpoints. One from uh, the monthly total volumetric Streamflow, which is what we're seeing in this graph. Um, and it, it kind of ranges uh, across the state, at least in the numbers, but there's a lot of things going on. This is actually very complex when you think about it because we've got snowpack melting off early. Um, and when you look at the range of values uh, at this time of year for such a, an early uh, melt off, it, it kind of plays tricks with the numbers, so to speak. Um, so as Russ mentioned earlier, that Del Norte was a, a great um, display, Russ. Um, it shows, you know, we were uh, we were running up uh, on the higher end. It, the graph that Russ showed didn't show the ranges there, but uh, that's kind of how I'm envisioning it, and that's probably why we have 130% of normal runoff for that uh, April 1 through April 30th time frame. Um, you know, the South Platte is running low because uh, snowpack wasn't that great uh, here in the South Platte, and then it's melting off actually a little bit later than normal, and I'll, I'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, the North Platte has seen some decent precipitation, um, more near normal precipitation more recently, and uh, their snowpack was doing uh, relatively well, so that's why we're seeing um, some of that uh, runoff be a little higher up there. Um, elsewhere, you know, the San Miguel de Loris Animas San Juan uh, runoff there is uh, still kind of trending um, before, earlier than normal, and I'll get into that here in just a little bit. Uh, but I, as Russ was mentioning, that uh, runoff peak has has probably already happened, particularly in some of these southern basins. Um, and and we'll, the 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 ninety percent uh, is is actually maybe some of the high that we'll wind up seeing, depending on how uh, the the rest of the hydrograph recedes here. And I think we're seeing that in some of these other basins. So. Um, what I decided to do was grab a few of the stream flow graphs uh, from around the state. And this is the graph that Rush showed earlier. Um, and, and I'll have to uh, pull this all together uh, with another graph um, later on with a snowpack. But, but here again, you'll actually see that snowpack peaked early in a lot of these southern basins and we, we see the, the snowpack increase 
or excuse me, we see the stream flow increase uh, as a result of, of the snowpack melt. And now it's probably starting to trend on its way down uh, if you extended uh, the, the average line here in gray off of this end over here, because that's just what it does is exactly what it does over here. Um, you'll see, we'll probably wind up seeing this, uh, the, the hydrograph for this year descend a good bit below where uh, it should be this time of year um, going further into this year. Um, moving further south into the Animus near uh, Durango, or excuse me, actually, I should say west, that's not south. Um, here again, probably going to wind up seeing the same thing. Uh, you'll see it from the snowpack graph here in a little bit. There's not much snow left to melt in that area, um, uh, at least uh, below tree line. Uh, there is a little bit above tree line, uh, but that's really not going to be a, a driver of the hydrograph uh, going forward here. Um, we'd have to have some real extreme temperatures, and even then, uh, we're, we're probably seeing that snow melt pretty quickly. Um, you can see a lot of the diurnal fluctuations here, which is what causes the, the line to kind of thicken, you, you know, uh, increased melt with uh, summer daylight or, you know, uh, longer daytime and daylight. And then uh, things kind of cool off a little bit at night and, and the, the runoff seems to slow a little bit. But it, uh, with these compressed graphs or these longer graphs with hourly readings, uh, it makes the line look thicker. So assuming this hydrograph is going to go down here pretty soon, this is actually really good to see. Um, uh, the Yampa River Basin uh, is actually showing that the hydrograph is, is running up uh, pretty high. And as I mentioned, as I'm going to show here in a little bit, uh, a number of these basins in the north actually held on to snow later than they typically do. So that's that's good. Uh, but there's, there's some not so good news with that as well. Um, uh, and then here again uh, on the White River, seeing the kind of the same thing as in the Yampa. Um, moving over into the North Platte, um, you know, we're, we're seeing that rise. There was a lot of ice. That's why uh, we're only getting some values here more recently into late April. Um, but would anticipate with the snowpack being where it is there in the North Platte, we're going to see some improvement. Uh, and then the Colorado River near Dotsero, uh, good that we're seeing an increase. Um, the, the Colorado River headwaters did pretty well for snowpack uh, this year in general. Um, so we'll have to see how long this hydrograph stays up and if it makes it up to the average peak. Um, I still have yet to, to peak out there probably. All right, moving on into reservoirs. Um, statewide reservoirs is 77% of normal uh, as of last month or the end of April, May 1. Um, but looking around the state, the story is a little bit more varied, uh, getting into the um, San Miguel Dolores, San Juan Basin reservoirs are only at 73% of normal. Um, in the Rio Grande, things are at 102% of normal, which is great after how reservoirs have been uh, over the past few years. Uh, however, it does seem as though um, with the likely decrease in runoff, going forward, uh, we might not have too much to fill reservoirs. And again, comparing to the normal, uh, that will probably mean a, a downward trend. But I, I don't manage these reservoirs. Um, it, it would be good to hear um, from some of those reservoir operators um, in, in the whole state to, to hear what uh, projections are, are for reservoirs uh, going forward, because uh, this is a pivotal month. Um, and because snowpack is peaking earlier than normal, especially in these southern basins, uh, again, it kind of plays with the numbers and we'll have to see how things uh, look for, for next month, uh, being this month and next month are so pivotal. But elsewhere, you know, uh, the South Platte, things are looking uh, relatively good in those northern basins, uh, the Colorado River Basin. Reservoir storage is relatively near normal, not too far below normal. And then looking here, I, I only decided, excuse me, to highlight uh, or sh display here the, the larger basins, the, the ones with the, the greater um, reservoir storage. Uh, unfortunately, when you put the, the, the larger basins together with the smaller basins, the smaller basins really uh, seem uh, insignificant and, and are hard to, to see. I shouldn't say they seem insignificant. They're, they're just hard to see on this graph. Um, so I have the statewide total and then a number of um, the, the larger basins here and, and seeing how they're trending over the long term. Uh, and you can see here that in most cases, uh, and of course statewide, the statewide total um, reservoir storage is down. All right, um, precipitation. What have we seen for precipitation? Um, looking at the uh, water year starting on October 1st here, um, 
total precipitation since October 1 has not been that great. Um, you know, in say the Gunnison, uh, the Gunnison has actually had a, a pretty darn good year compared to some of the past years. And I would even argue in the last decade, this year has been pretty good for the Gunnison. Um, and, and especially when you compare it to the rest of the state, the Gunnison really has been a, a pretty nice bullseye for um, the precipitation that we have had. Um, so it's at 94% year to date. Um, the northern basins are all in the 90s, whereas the, the southern basins are all still running pretty dry, unfortunately. Uh, taking the time scale down a bit, looking at the last month, uh, as Russ pointed out, uh, precipitation in the southern part of the state has been uh, quite poor. Um, uh, ignore the negative 25% of normal and the negative 12s. Uh, we've, we've had some um, uh, crews in the area performing maintenance to our snow tell and we haven't had a chance to, to edit that data. Those values are, are not valid, of course. Uh, can't really have negative precipitation, uh, not really. Uh, but you know, in the northern portion of the state, uh, precipitation has been better, but just extremely dry here uh, month to date in the southern half of the state. And and really, you know, going back in time as we're going to do here with this graph, the last 60 days, uh, things really don't look uh, too much better. Again, story still the same. Uh, poor precipitation in the southern half of the state, uh, better in the north, but but still not great in the north. It's definitely been drier. Um, across much of the state, particularly in these last 60 days. Looking at some of the precipitation trends uh, here again, I, I, I just wanted to suss out uh, the, the statewide kind of what's going on statewide and then some of the more um, indicator basins or maybe even the little bit more extreme on the ends. Uh, statewide precipitation, uh, as Russ w mentioned, you know, didn't start off too great, or actually statewide, it started off all right. And then we got a bump here uh, in, that, in January. I think everybody remember those, those storms in late December, early January, and then things dried out again. And then we started to get some, some decent precip until March, April, and then uh, the, the faucet kind of turned off again. And then here's some of our prospects. It's gonna take, of course, above normal precipitation to, to get back to normal by the, by the end of the water year on September 30th. Looking at some of the, the traces here, just look at the, looking at the last two years, uh, it's interesting that uh, statewide precipitation is above where we were in both 21 and, uh, and 2020, um, but, but still relatively close. I mean, we're right in the ballpark, still below normal. Uh, statewide precipitation is 91% of median, and uh, we're, we're in that 25th percentile. So we are uh, looking pretty low with still 130 some days left in the water year. Um, Moving down again into the southwest, the San Miguel de Lower San Juan basins, um, it's dried out uh, since you know uh, March, uh, early April. Haven't seen much. A lot of the graphics that we've seen have have shown that that, that things have been pretty dry. Um, so here, uh, precipitation is eighty five uh, percent of median of yesterday when I updated all these graphics, and then moving into the Colorado headwaters just to get a sample of what's going on. Uh, very, very similar to 2020, where we are right now, um, but below normal at 92% of median here again, better in the north um, and and uh, worse for precipitation in the south. Okay, where's snowpack at? Um, been in the news a fair amount, uh, so it's really no surprise, uh, not great. Uh, Russ uh, and, and Becky hit on um, Becky and the media hit on some of those melt rates that we've seen uh, in the southern half of the state, and, and they have been high, no doubt about it. Russ's uh, uh, table that he showed was a great um, uh, a great depiction of, of those uh, higher melt rates. I'm going to show it in a slightly different way here uh, in a map. Um, but yeah, it shows that uh, between all of the, the solar that we have and the lack of precipitation. Uh, but I think a lot of the, the sunny days that we've had have really uh, drawn down that snowpack faster than it typically happens. Uh, and when I was in Telluride about a month, month and a half ago, um, there was a lot of dust on snow. Uh, and with all the solar uh, and less clouds, um, uh, there, we, there's, there's probably some relationship to the fact that uh, all of that dust on the snow is, is probably um, depleting that snowpack faster than normal. So definitely seeing the, the depletion uh, quicker in, in the southern half of the state. So there's that. There's also the fact that uh, snowpack peaked 
um, earlier than normal in the southern half of the state, and I'll get to that here in a little bit. So statewide, um, snowpack is only at 51% of median. That ranks 28th highest out of 37 years on the in the period of record. Um, and uh, snowpack uh, is about 89% uh, of the median peak, Snow, excuse me, snowpack peaked out at 85% of the median peak. Uh, and I'll be honest, I generated these numbers from a tool that's slightly different than this one. The way the actual calculations are performed are, are, are different than this one. So it, it might not seem exactly like 89%, um, but, but it gives you a general idea of, of where things are at. Um, in the Arkansas, uh, snowpack uh, peaked out pretty much on time, um, but below normal, unfortunately, 94% of normal. Uh, and however, uh, snowpack is only 37% of normal uh, here uh, in, the, in the southern half, or excuse me, um, in the Arkansas. And that's uh, 29th highest of uh, 42 years. Okay, so uh, in the Rio Grande, um, and kind of highlighting some of those southern basins here, snowpack uh, peaked early, uh, a little bit early. We did have a little bit of a bump a little later on that essentially allowed snowpack to hold on a little bit longer. But then uh, if you see this being the average snowmelt line, the green line here, you can see uh, that our, our, our melt rates uh, earlier on were a good bit higher than normal, especially for this time. And even uh, during the, the heart of typical melt, uh, it was a, a little bit above normal, a good bit above normal, uh, and then kind of leveled out a little bit. But based on the actual mathematics, uh, the, the, the trend here, the trend line actually tends to, to level off anyway, um, with the way, is the way that that works mathematically. But uh, still, those melt rates are relatively high. That's why you see these kind of tails on all of these uh, traces here. So in the Rio Grande uh, snowpack, uh, below tree line is, or in tree line, I should say, is, is pretty much melted out. There's probably a fair, there's a little bit of snowpack uh, above uh, tree line, um, but, but from what we're seeing from the snow tell sites, uh, you know, it's essentially gone at this point. And, and that doesn't mean just because our snow tells are, are void of, of snowpack doesn't mean that we don't have an indicator of what's going on uh, above tree line. We do, and that's why we have our water supply forecast. Um, we still have an idea of what's gonna run off based on the snowpack that's above tree line as well. Um, it's just not represented in the snow tell sites. So um, fortunately, uh, Snowpack here uh, peaked out at 93, 99% of normal. Uh, you'll notice that the Southern Basin snowpacks uh, were very close to actually uh, actual normal snowpack peak. Um, and and uh, so that's something that actually bodes well uh, for those Southern Basins, but uh, the, the Northern, Northern Basins uh, saw a below normal snowpack peak but the peak is, is occurring later. Uh, here in the Gunnison River Basin, only 40% of the, the snowpack left, 97% um, of the, the typical snowpack peak. And here again, it did happen earlier. Uh, there was some, some holding on of the snowpack, but it did wind up melting out relatively fast compared to normal for the time and normal for um, the, the typical uh, full-on melt rates. And, and here again, since we're past, or actually, I guess I haven't mentioned this, since snowpack uh, has kind of past the steep point of, um, of, of the snow melt or the snow graph, uh, that usually begins to indicate that uh, stream flows should begin to come down uh, relatively soon. Uh, we, we've probably seen the, the hydrograph peak on a lot of these streams um, in, in these basins where we're, we're seeing the, the, the snow melt uh, trace start to, to tail off. Um, uh, here in the, the Gunnison, snowpack peaked about 97% of normal, and that's 24th highest of 42 years. Uh, and the entire Colorado River headwaters, snowpack was about 90, snowpack peak was 91% of normal, 92% of normal. Uh, and here, as I was pointing out, it kind of peaked a little bit on the late side, um, but not too late. But now we're seeing uh, those melt rates also uh, relatively high uh, for this time of year and for the typical. Uh, currently, snowpack is at 50% of normal. Um, and, and melting pretty quickly. And that's 28th highest in 41 years. Moving on to the South Platte, uh, here again, slightly late peak, but below normal. Um, and, and snowpack is melting a good bit closer to normal here, um, probably because of elevation. And uh, snowpack was 33rd highest of 42 years. And actually, you know what, I, I better be careful. I, I better 
be specific. Uh, as we're looking at, or as I stated, 33 highest, that might be a bit confusing. That's actually uh, lowest, I should actually say, of 42 years. So it's not uh, 33rd highest, it's 33rd lowest. And that goes for all of these. Forgive me for, for doing that. Uh, for mistaking that. Uh, here, snowpack is actually 68% of median in the, the South Platte. And then the Yampa White here again, uh, a late later snowpack peak for the snowpack that we had, um, but it is below normal. Uh, right now it's only 65% of normal and uh, it was only 84% of the median snowpack peak. Uh, and that's um, 29th lowest of 37 years. Definitely on the lower side in the lower percentiles here, forgive me. Um, and then finally on the Laramie and, and North Platte Basin, uh, actually no, not finally, we got one more after this, 92% uh, of normal and 30, 30, 30 lowest out of 42 years um, for Snowpack Peak and 73% of normal. And then um, down in the San Miguel, Dolores, Santa Ana, San Juan, forgive me, maybe I already showed this one, um, peaked at 92% of normal and very little Snowpack left there, just some above tree line. Um, so we'll have to see what the hydrograph does. As I mentioned earlier, it's more than likely on its way down um, in, the, in, in many of those Southern basins. Um, let's see, did I present this right? Yeah, snowpack is a percent of median. Oh, and so to complement uh, Russ's uh, table from earlier, um, this shows where snowpack peaked as a percent of median for all the individual sites. I can't do this for uh, all the basins and the sites. Uh, so I just decided to do it for the sites. Uh, and you see here that, you know, um, in general, things peaked below uh, normal at the majority of sites across the state, um, particularly in the, the northern half. You don't see very many 100s. You see a few uh, 100s and a little bit above here in the southern half of the state in the San Juan. Um, but elsewhere, yeah. Uh, Snowpack peaked pretty much below normal across much of the state. Okay, so this is the complement to Russ's table. Um, this is uh, how early or late uh, snowpack peaked at all of the sites. And if it's negative 15 days, say here, uh, that means it peaked 15 days early, I believe. Um, and then if it's, uh, this means it peaked 26 days late here for, for this site right here. Um, Mendo Pass or, you know, um, any one of these sites, you know, negative 20 is early and uh, positive is late. So you can see that we have uh, a mixture, you know, it, it, it's kind of uh, is all over the place. It, it's pretty close to normal, I think, when my eyes kind of average it out. Um, and I'm going to look most particularly here at the, the southern half of the, the state, uh, because as I transition to the next graph, you can see that we're relatively near normal. But when we transition here to this graph, which actually shows when snowpack actually melts out and what those anomalies are, you can see that almost all of these values show early snow melt uh, or snowpack melt out where the snowpack melts off, you can see a bunch of negative values. And, and that goes to show how quickly the snowpack melted compared to normal. If it was melting a, 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 along that normal trend line, you would see these values be near similar to what they were here in this previous graph. You'd see you know, some positives and negatives here in the, the southern half of the state. But uh, if you look at the, the southern half of the state here, you see a, most of these values are negative and, and drastically negative. We're looking at you know three weeks. Um, to the negative, uh, two weeks to the negative uh, in the early um, range here. So that goes to show how quickly a lot of that snowpack melted off this year, particularly in the southern half of the state. Don't have values quite uh, in the northern half of the state. We don't have as many values in the northern half of the state, but we are seeing that they are trending, uh, at least the ones that we're seeing uh, kind of early. So, okay. Um, Forgive me for these next graphs uh, or, or uh, charts. Uh, I, I decided to throw them in there and it has all of the values. They're probably gonna be pretty small if you can zoom in. I don't know if you can zoom on a Zoom conference uh, in on these uh, to actually see the values uh, for your um, forecast point of interest. Uh, but my point in showing these is just to kind of get a general idea of what's going on in the basins. Um, of where those stream flow forecasts are, are set based on uh, our, our um, May 1 values. So the gray line here is normal. 
And then uh, the, the range here, the, the color swath shows the potential range of runoffs that are expected for uh, the given time frame uh, and uh, the, the given forecast point. Um, and in general, what I'm trying to do is show that uh, if you look at that green range, the, the bold number in the middle of the green range, that's the most probabilistic outcome. You know, and if you look at the whole green range uh, here again, that's the more likely outcome that we're going to see. And I'm trying to show here that uh, in many cases, um, across all of the forecasts that I'm going to show here, uh, they are below normal. There are some that are near normal, like here in the North Platte, North Cape, the Laramie River, um, uh, and Yampa near Stagecoach. Um, some of those are, are kind of normal, but, but trend um, away from normal, trend below normal, uh, the further downstream you get here, at least in the Yampa and, and North Platte. Sorry, I'm going to skip to uh, this, this map uh, version of the output uh, real quick. I'll go back into those, those other uh, charts here in a little bit for the other basins. Um, but basically, this one map shows uh, the stream flow forecast as they were for May 1 uh, for the most frequently used forecast across the state. And you can see that, you know, other than the North Platte, uh, most of the basins uh, are, are forecast to have below to well below normal stream flows uh, this spring and, and summer, unfortunately. Uh, not that it's too much of a surprise, but, but here are some of those percentage values that we've got. Um, okay, so here's where things get kind of small, and and forgive me, but you know, uh, the the San Miguel Dolores, San Jose, San Juan. Here's that gray line. Here's that normal line, and you can see um, the the forecast are for below to well below normal. This is the 60% of normal uh, range right here. Uh, so you know, some of these downstream. Um, uh, or, or I shouldn't say that. Uh, by the way, this basin is set up, but you know some of some of the the, the um, basins further off to the west, I believe that is, uh, are looking at slightly better forecasts. But really, they're they're all near about the same. Um, in the Upper Rio Grande, uh, the Conejos area, uh, the Upper Rio Grande uh, are showing some of the better forecasts, um, but still they're all forecast uh, to be below normal for those most probabilistic outcomes unless we get um, some good precip uh, to really boost things up here in the spring um, and, and summer. Uh, it, it's probably not going to happen based on some of the outlooks that, that Russ showed earlier. And then here uh, on the South Platte, same kind of thing. Uh, fortunately, the further north we get, kind of like the, the North Platte uh, in the South Platte, you know, once you get into the, the Cache La Poudre, the Big Thompson uh, and, and Boulder Creek, those kinds of areas because precipitation was a bit more favorable up there. Um, runoff is looking a little bit better, closer to normal, but most probabilistically the outcomes are, 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 are below normal, at least slightly below normal. Uh, and then the, the basins in the upper South Platte and South Park um, are, are showing um, more poor runoff. Uh, Arkansas River Basin, um, such as the Purgatory River Basin, uh, Kacharis, those areas are, are looking at below normal runoff. Uh, however, further north in the basin, uh, up and closer to the headwaters runoff is looking better. Excuse me. Uh, Gunnison River Basin, as I was mentioning kind of earlier, uh, Upper Taylor, uh, East River Slate, you know, the Upper Gunnison, near Gunnison, better forecast, uh, relatively close to normal, actually a few that are slightly above normal for the, the most probabilistic. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, uh, looking at below normal runoff um, on some of those feeder streams, you know, the Uncapangre, um, even the, fortunately the, the main stem of the Gunnison North Fork is looking okay uh, and Muddy Creek looks all right, but, but um, otherwise, you know, stream flow forecasts are in the 60% of normal range, 70% of normal range for those most likely outcomes. And then in the upper Colorado, uh, here again, below normal. Um, okay, uh, so those uh, forecasts that I just showed are all based on May 1 data and are provided on May 1, but what's going on since then? Um, just I selected a few of our daily guidance forecasts, um, just kind of just show what the trend has been since um, those monthly forecasts. And if you kind of uh, take some of these trend lines, the green lines and, and um, kind of paste them out from where the actual monthly monthly forecast fell uh, based on these yellow dots, you can see that the trend is downward. Um, things have been pretty dry as Russ and I have mentioned. And uh, right now it's looking like uh, 
the forecast for June 1 may be down. Now we've got to remember that there are uh, there is that prospect for precipitation at least here um, in the the northern mountains in the the Front Range and even on the in the Colorado River headwaters, uh, the North Platte, uh, and probably in the Arkansas and, and parts of the um, Maybe in the, a little bit in the Rio Grande, we might see some bumps, but uh, how much precipitation will really determine if we, you know, kind of get back to normal or maybe have a little bit of a boost. But um, will it be enough to actually sustain us and overcome the, the deficits that we've had um, for the beginning of this month? So there, um, sorry, that was the Colorado River near Dotsero. It looks like we're looking currently at a, at a slightly down forecast. I would actually argue here too that uh, in the upper South Platte, we got a, a downward trend. Unfortunately, the uh, monthly forecast did not show up for May 1. I'm not sure what happened there, but this is a pretty important forecast point. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that we probably are gonna see a, a decrease in forecast um, for June 1 in the South Platte, depending on how much precipitation we get out of the storm. Um, and then Taylor Park Reservoir, same thing, downward trend uh, here in the Rio Grande at 30 mile, again, uh, significantly down, I would argue. Um, and, and the Animus at Durango um, is showing maybe not so much of a downward trend, maybe because uh, snowpack is, is mostly depleted there. Okay, in summary, um, I, I, I threw this in there. Uh, this is a video I found when I was back in DC trying to clean out somebody's old office uh, and, and thought that this was uh, a pretty good movie. I don't have a VHS player, so I was not able to watch it. Um, but if anybody does have one, uh, I, I think I st we still have this. I might be able to watch it. Let me know. Okay, uh, in short, uh, soil moisture, uh, pretty dry leading uh, into this runoff season, which is never that great. Uh, we'll have to see how things wind up running off. I'm gonna try and go through this fast. I think I'd have taken up uh, way more than my time allotted. Um, uh, stream flow uh, up to this point has been all over the place. Uh, in general, it, it came up uh, probably because of the increased snowmelt runoff, but we'll probably trend uh, back down where we'll have to see, at least in some of the, the higher basins, such as the North Platte and the Upper Rio Grande, uh, things should start to trend upward a little bit um, in, in many of those other basins, but we'll have to see how it compares to normal. Reservoir storage is below normal statewide at 77%. Uh, but in other parts of the state, more in the eastern basins, things are, are looking a bit closer to normal at this point. We'll have to see how things for reservoir storage uh, pan out next month or at the end of this month, I should say. Um, year to date, uh, statewide precipitation um, is below normal um, across much of the state. Better, better in the northern half of the state, uh, but, but trending uh, away from normal there. Um, and, and things uh, more recently are, are very dry, more particularly in the southern portion of the state. Uh, snowpack uh, peaked out a little bit below normal, but is below normal now because of above normal um, uh, melt-off rates. But our, our peak was near about 80% of normal, or excuse me, a bit near about 90% of normal statewide. Um, so it wasn't wasn't too bad, but when you when you put it on top of uh, the low stream flows that we've seen and the 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 low um, uh, soil moisture that we have, um, it, it doesn't bode well for runoff as we saw there. So I've, I've really kind of gone over most of this. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into it too deep again because I've taken too much time. Forgive me, um, Jeff, sorry. Uh, reservoirs are, are between 73 and 104 percent of normal, but are, are closer to about 77 percent of normal. Um, and uh, stream flow forecasts aren't looking all that great. We'll have to see what this uh, coming storm does for us, but it only looks like it's going to impact that the northeastern mountains of Colorado um, and see if it really provides uh, any relief. So that's all that I have, uh, and I'm happy to field any questions now. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, so helpful, as always. Um, would you mind um, putting the website where we can, where people can access all of those um, graphs in the chat? And Russ, same with you, um, so that folks can go and dive into that data a little deeper on their own. That would be really helpful. Yes, I'm happy to do that. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, next up, I'm really excited to introduce um, Jeff Deems. 
and he will be sharing um, with us about a project that he and his team have been working on um, doing aerial snow measurements across the state. And um, so Jeff, are you, will you be presenting? Should I give you the um, co-host? Yes, please. And Eric okay. Sky will jump in uh, with a couple of things, but we'll just use my slide deck here. Great. So yes, I also want to introduce my colleague at CWCB, Eric, um, who is uh, the CWCB lead on this project. So thanks so much, Jeff. Take it away. We can see your slides. Great. Thanks, Megan. Uh, thanks to Russ and Brian for um, setting a lot of the stage here. That's super helpful. And and Brian, you were apologetic about those um, uh, the forecast slides, but I thought those were an awesome way to, to really get a picture of all of those uh, exceedance forecasts across the state. I'm excited to look at those more. Um, I hadn't seen that presentation before. Uh, so uh, thanks everyone and thanks Megan for the opportunity to present here today uh, about the Colorado Airborne Snow Measurement Program um, and Airborne Snow Observatory activities um, this year. I'm Jeff Deems. I'm one of the co-founders and chief technology officer for Airborne Snow Observatories, Inc. Um, and Eric Skye, uh, who also should be on, will be uh, presenting some of this with me. Eric, are you live? Hi, everybody. Eric Skye with the Colorado Water Conservation Board. As Megan said, I am CWCB's lead on this project, and thank you all for having us today. Awesome. So we'll uh, jump right into it here. Um, there we go. A bit of an outline, uh, just the structure of this presentation. Uh, I'll go over a bit of the, the Colorado Airborne Snow Measurements uh, Program Working Group um, and, and the, the motivation there. Um, lead into some of the, the motivation for what it is, uh, and how we do it, and, and where we've been doing it with the Air, Airborne Snow Observatory, and, and um, highlight some of the results uh, to date with water year 2022 activities. And then uh, a couple slides talking about uh, the, the near term and program build out uh, plans for the program. Uh, so the Colorado Airborne Snow Measurement Program or CASM was formed uh, just a couple of years ago with uh, leadership um, from a couple of front range utilities, Denver and Northern Water, um, Dolores Water Conservancy District, uh, Linker providing some technical uh, support uh, and then myself at ASO Inc. And uh, initial funding for this program was, was uh, through WSRF funds uh, to engage stakeholders statewide and produce a report um, that, will, that details the, the program need and a sustained pathway. That report will be out soon. Uh, meanwhile, uh, this program received letters of support from all the state roundtables. Uh, and we have, uh, I think even 100 might be a, a low estimate now. Uh, engage stakeholders who are regularly uh, participating um, in this uh, in the regular meetings and and uh, and updates. Um, as a part of this activity, uh, the Chasm Group uh, successfully competed for a 2022 water plan grant uh, to expand the program, uh, leveraging a lot of uh, local and federal program investment in specific basin activities. Um, this water plane grant has added snow on flights this year in the Colorado headwaters, um, the upper Gunnison, Dolores and Caneos basins, as well as uh, some upcoming work this summer to, uh, to expand the, the, the so-called shovel ready basins, those where the snow free data has been prepped to the point where we're ready for real time um, monitoring uh, in those basins in 20, 2023 and and beyond. Um, additionally, there's some up, there's been ongoing outreach uh, with the stakeholder group and some upcoming data workshops to, to expand um, engagement uh, with these data sets. Uh, and lastly, the, the, the broader goal of the CASM program is to lay the foundation for and identify a pathway forward for a sustained program um, within the state of Colorado, leveraging uh, state federal partnership activities um, and, and in close collaboration with um, with the uh, federal and other forecast agencies. So the getting into some of the motivation here, uh, really we're all used to uh, dealing with the snowmelt systems and their associated uncertainty uh, year to year. Um, and I've got the example here of the, the Rio Grande at Del Norte um, 
Uh, but really we see this uh, statewide where the, the interannual variability and a lot of the factors that, that Russ and Brian highlighted in terms of uh, the, um, the, the hydroclimate uh, variations year to year and seasonally, as well as other factors that uh, like dust on snow, for example, that, that have dramatic impacts uh, on snow accumulation and melt. Um, we end up with uh, a, a range of, of forecast accuracies or forecast uncertainties um, that make decision-making during this time of year uh, quite difficult. Uh, so for this example, you, looking at June forecasts in the Rio Grande um, for that April through September runoff volume, we could see some years um, with, with pretty tight forecasts in the single digit percentages, and then other years um, with fairly dramatic departures. And so not knowing at this decision point, um, what, whether this is going to be a 5% year or a 25% year uh, makes uh, Craig, Cotton, Craig Cotton's job a lot more challenging, um, particularly not, with, not only with the local impacts um, of, of curtailment, et cetera, or flood impacts, but also the interstate compact delivery requirements, um, uh, casting a broader umbrella over all that where uh, the, the state of Colorado owes the state of New Mexico a certain percentage um, of the annual flow. And if we don't meet that, um, then we owe them, um, uh, well, there's, a, there's some repercussions there. Uh, or if we meet it with plenty of room to spare, then perhaps there's some, um, some unnecessarily curtailment that had to happen there. So uh, all of this puts a premium on uh, an early and accurate forecast. Um, and one of the challenges that we work with is, is how we're monitoring the snowpack. And this is, Brian went into this in great detail, so I'll, I'll skim through it here. But the big picture is that, um, that the snow tunnel network and the snow courses, uh, the manual snow courses, are used for statistical forecasting of runoff, not for measuring actual water equivalent volume. Um, and that has to do with just the nature of monitoring snow uh, in mountain watersheds. It's very difficult to get the full picture of what's going on there. If we zoom in, um, and these are from a couple of days ago, if we zoom in here at the upper Gunnison uh, and, and North Fork of the Gunnison, um, we can see that, that these areas, the, the numbers in these basins are derived from just a pretty small set of, of stations. Um, and as Brian mentioned, they're, they're below tree line in, uh, in forest clearings. So what's going on above tree line uh, and what's going on below these station networks um, or station elevations is not something that's well captured by this network. So we see here in the state of Colorado, uh, a good bit of terrain above and below the snow tail elevations um, that is not directly captured um, through this monitoring. Um, and, and that has an importance uh, when we look at the, uh, the vulnerability of our operational forecast models to changing conditions, conditions that deviate from the period of record. Uh, and we are seeing dramatic departures from our historic uh, record with factors, um, uh, a lot of climate change factors like warming temperatures and shifting snow season durations um, uh, to uh, forest cover impacts like major wildfire or beetle kill. Uh, and this year, of course, uh, as in many years, uh, dust on snow affecting, uh, strongly affecting melt off rates. Um, so these departures from normal I mean, as we get to the edges of the historic distribution, uh, that means that our, our statistical forecasts or our, our calibrated index-based forecasts struggle to adapt to those conditions simply because they're not well represented in that, that historic record. To put it simply, these methods assume that the, the historic calibrations or the historic data apply to this year, that this year is like years in the past. And as we get further away from that, um, the risk of, um, of, uh, uh, of the forecast deviating from, from the observations gets greater. So one way to, to help accommodate that and help these, um, uh, these processes going forward is to actually measure, expand our measurement of uh, the snowpack throughout the watersheds. Snowmelt timing and volume is controlled by the accumulation of water equivalent, snow water equivalent or SWE uh, throughout the watershed where it is and how much there is um, affects uh, how much and when it melts off. And then snow albedo or its reflectivity 
affects how much solar radiation is absorbed and is the dominant control um, on that snow melt rate uh, in, the, in Colorado environments. Uh, so having accurate full basin SWE and albedo can really help reduce forecast uncertainty and start those forecast processes from, uh, from a much more uh, reliable state. This would have the effect of, of decreasing our, this reliance on this year being like years in the past. Um, it avoids assumptions that we have to make about how well the, the current station network represents um, conditions within the basin in any individual year, not just over uh, a long time period. Um, and also offers, offers the opportunity to put these existing data uh, to work in new ways that don't just rely on, uh, on that historic comparison. So that's the foundation uh, and motivation for uh, the ASO uh, program. This program started as a NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory project in 2013. Um, and over the years, expanded um, uh, and refined uh, the program to the point where we uh, reached an applications readiness level beyond NASA's science mission. So they um, helped transition the program out of NASA. Uh, and we, um, we formed Airborne Snow Observatories, Inc., basically with our full staff from JPL uh, to continue doing this process uh, without any gap in, in coverage. So we measure snow water equivalent by mapping snow depth first from differential elevation mapping using a laser scanner. We get to water equivalent from snow depth using observations of snow density from the Snowtel and snow course networks, uh, as well as a, a distributed snowpack model uh, based on those observations. And we measure snow albedo directly using imaging spectrometers, which are high resolution, high spectral resolution cameras that see out from the visible through into the near infrared wavelengths. Uh, and we couple those measurements with physical models um, and we do unique high altitude uh, flight operations to get full basin coverage with, with rapid turnaround. Um, this program has seen uh, parallel development in California and Colorado since 2013. Our first flight ever actually um, as ASO was in Colorado and we've, um, we've done quite a bit of work in Colorado over the years. Uh, in California, we've had over 350 snow on flights in the past uh, decade over 10 basins and um, have built out this operational capacity to map uh, central and southern Sierra SWE volumes. That's now continuing and building out uh, into the northern part of the state as well, uh, looking to achieve full state coverage there in the next two years. Um, in Colorado, as I mentioned, um, there's been ongoing both science and operations support um, uh, since 2013. And recently the formation of the CHASM group has really helped um, coalesce the, the stakeholder interest and support behind this program and, and identify what the, the, the future program should look like. Additionally, we're um, working elsewhere in the Western US uh, in partnership with the Bureau of Reclamation and others. Um, we have the uh, Wharf Hydro uh, runoff forecasting program in partnership with, uh, with um, partners at NCAR. Um, and that's something where the Colorado program with support from CWCB has really been leading the charge on that more hydro forecasting and uh, California is now um, um, building on the program uh, that has, has been led here in the state of Colorado. A couple examples on uh, what these data look like uh, and some of the operational implications to date. Uh, so this was, um, I didn't put the year on this. This is April 18th, 2021. So last year's flight. Uh, uh, on April 18th in the Blue River, uh, Lake Dillon just out of view um, to the bottom of the screen here. We're looking at um, the town and, and ski area of Breckenridge in the 10 mile range here uh, and the Copper Mountain ski area over to the right. Uh, and this is a snow depth map, three meter resolution. And you can see the, the low snow depths in blue uh, and the deepest snow in red being uh, three meters or greater of snow depth. Um, so this is the April 18th flight, and you can pretty clearly see tree line where we change from these yellows into a much highly variable, much more highly variable snow depth environment um, with, with broadly shallow snow depths and then very deep accumulations uh, in wind drifted uh, and avalanche deposit areas above tree line. So quite a lot of snow up there, but it's, it's mostly uh, confined to 
um, to small areas of very deep snow. As we merge into the May flight, we can see the melt out that happens. I'll toggle back and forth here a little bit so we can see the lower elevations melting out and the, the distributions at upper elevations remaining uh, largely similar, um, although the overall depth uh, is changing uh, as, we, as we melt. Um, here's what the, the Blue River um, uh, four snowtail group uh, trace looked like through 2021. And so our first flight was right near Peak Sui, uh, and the second flight was right as most of these, uh, most of the snow pillows were starting to melt out. Um, and then we can, you can aggregate these data uh, in lots of different ways uh, to explore how the, the snow is distributed uh, throughout the landscape. So these two rose plots are, are uh, looking at the elevation and aspect distribution of, of um, water equivalent in the Blue River Basin. So um, the, the highest elevations, it's like looking down on the top of a conical mountain. So the highest elevations are in the center, lowest elevations around the edge and then uh, different aspect bins around the compass rows. So we can see that the majority of water equivalent volume at this time um, on May 24th was on these northeast facing slopes at middle elevations. Uh, and then the change between the two flights, we can see we lost a lot of that low elevation snowpack. That's fairly obvious from it just disappearing. Uh, but these upper elevations, we actually gained water equivalent over that time period due to a series of storms. Um, during the intervening, intervening period, uh, and we can see the distribution of, of the majority of that, um, uh, that new snow lining up well with the, uh, with the existing snow drift. So a big wind dominated environment there in the 10 mile range and, and the rest of the Blue River. So putting these data to work, um, providing operational guidance, a couple examples from California here. Um, the San Joaquin River Restoration Program run by the US, US Bureau of Reclamation. Um, our fish recovery program has been using uh, these data for a number of years, enabling more accurate and earlier uh, forecasts, uh, which allows them to determine their, their water year type earlier, which um, determines their, uh, their fish flows allocation. Um, in part using these data, they've been able to rewater the lower San Joaquin and restore salmon runs to that system, um, which has been uh, a, a notable success for that program. And really, uh, we see this as a model for other fish re recovery programs that are ongoing um, uh, in Colorado or elsewhere. Uh, just to the south of the San Joaquin Basin in the Kings, uh, a, a good flood um, mitigation example in 2019. Uh, on that system, the, the major storage reservoir uh, operations get taken over by the Army Corps when there's a flood designation. The Army Corps operates that infrastructure um, solely for flood protection and no, not for uh, water delivery obligations. Um, our data in 2019 showed that there was quite a lot more water up in the watershed than the, uh, than the RFC forecasts um, or the state forecasts were indicating and allowed the, the Kings River Water Association to operate on the 10% exceedance rather than the 50%, which is their typical mandate. By doing this, they were able to avoid a flood de declaration um, and avoid buying water later in the season on the open market. Uh, this allowed them to save 100,000 acre feet of water uh, and meet their obligations, which at 2019 prices saved them $100 million. Um, in 2022 prices, some of you may have seen news recently, um, the, the water uh, lease prices in California have doubled since then. Uh, so that would have been a $200 million savings at current prices. Uh, so a couple of interesting um, applications for different management objectives uh, in, in a few years in California there. Closer to home here, 2019 in the Blue River Basin, um, similar to 2021, we had a couple of flights uh, in that system. We flew near Peak Sui and again, just near when uh, the snow tails were, were just about melted out. That second flight also corresponded with a, a stream flow peak, which uh, if you ignore uh, that hydrograph to the right of our second flight, that's what the operational uh, awareness was at that um, at on the 24th of June. So uh, the operators uh, at, at Dillon Reservoir weren't sure whether that was the peak for the season or whether there was more to come. Uh, our flight on June 24th showed that there was still 115,000 acre feet of water left in the basin. Uh, they delayed their operations for a couple of weeks, allowed uh, releases to continue from the dam. That allowed them to capture that second stream flow peak. 
without flooding Silverthorn, uh, always a good uh, operational outcome. Uh, and in retrospect, that 115,000 acre feet ended up being half of the total annual inflow um, to the reservoir that year. Um, so that was, uh, that was an important result, capturing that snowpack um, above, uh, above tree line. Uh, that was a, a, a major component of the runoff that year. So zooming in on, on uh, water year 2022 this year, um, to date, we've flown two flights in each of the Dolores and Caneos, uh, April 15th and May 10th in both of those basins. Uh, one flight um, in uh, the Colorado River headwaters above Windy Gap, the Blue River at Dillon, the East at Almont and the Taylor at Taylor Park Reservoir. We actually just flew the East again yesterday. Those data in, are in production uh, and we're trying to fly the Taylor today. We're on ground hold due to some turbulence. Um, hope this incoming storm uh, prefrontal winds aren't too strong for us to get off the ground at some point today. So stay tuned on that one. Um, the, the map on the right is a screenshot from our data um, delivery portal. All of these uh, data um, are freely accessible through, uh, through our website. Uh, thanks to, to open data requirements from, from all of our stakeholder partners. So here's what uh, the first flights have looked like for, um, uh, for the four central and northern basins, uh, Colorado River at Windy Gap on the left, uh, East River at Almont is the Africa-shaped basin in the center, Taylor Park uh, Reservoir Basin, bottom right, and then Blue River at Dillon, top right. Um, and uh, you can see our, our measured SWE volumes for each of these. Um, each of these basins or each of these surveys comes with um, a full reporting um, on, on what the, the SWE distributions are and the processes uh, involved in determining depth, uh, density, and water equivalent. Um, so I encourage um, everyone to go download the, the data from our website and, and read into those reports. There's a lot of good, a lot of good info in there. Uh, moving to the two southern basins where we have two flights, we can examine the change over time in these. Uh, I'll start with the Kaneos, uh, April 15th, uh, depth distribution is shown in the map here. Um, and then going into May 10th, you can see the strong uh, melt out, massive decrease in snow covered area. Um, and we calculated 169,000 acre feet of water um, on April 15th, down to 60,000 acre feet on May 10th. So lost over 100,000 acre feet um, just in three weeks a little over three weeks there. Um, and uh, that's reflected in this elevation profile, uh, top right here, the SWE volume with elevation, April flight shown in blue, um, and the May 10th flight shown in red there, um, and as well as the two different rose diagrams there. That strong melt out, uh, as both uh, Brian and Russ mentioned, uh, predominantly due to uh, dust this year. So here's a plot, an elevation plot of uh, visible broadband and infrared albedo, so reflectivity um, in uh, on May 10th in the Caneos. Um, just looking at the broadband for simplicity here, uh, we're looking at just under 40%, 38%, um, pretty much across the elevation range, um, which means only 38% of the incoming solar is being reflected. Typically clean snow at this time of year would be up in the mid 70s uh, in percentage wise as far as reflected solar radiation. So um, <laughs> that's a massive what we call radiative forcing extra radiation going into the snowpack due to the presence of dust. Um, and really serving to as a has pouring gas on the fire of, of snow melt this year and producing those really steep snow melt rates um, that both Russ and, and Brian showed. Moving over into the Dolores, a uh, pretty similar situation uh, over there, showing the April 15th map here, and then the May 10th. Um, uh, similar with the Caneos, um, a lot of snow covered area lost, uh, and the bulk of the snowpack, we went from 188,000 acre feet down to 61. Uh, so a lot, uh, a bit over 120,000 acre feet melt out. Um, again, just over uh, three weeks uh, of duration there. Similar story with the albedos um, in the Dolores, a little bit different in that there's a bit of an increase in albedo. So still some, some not as dusty snow uh, remaining on, on May 10th uh, at the highest elevations. Uh, and here's what that looks like uh, uh, in some paired images here. This is Wilson Peak uh, in the uh, top left of the image. 
red, green, blue are visible um, wavelength uh, map on the left there, or image on the left, and then snow albedo on the right. Uh, and so you can see on some of these north facing slopes where the albedos are up 65 or 70 percent, um, they look quite a bit cleaner uh, in the in the RGB image on the left. You, but we can really see like that picture from Jeff Derry that Russ showed earlier, just um, really awfully brown snowpacks out there. Uh, and it doesn't take much imagination to uh, to envision the extra solar radiation going into the snowpack at, uh, at, with a with a snow surface that looks like that. Okay, uh, backing out a bit to the broader program, um, one component of the, the CHASM work group um, work this year has been uh, a fairly uh, broad and detailed survey uh, of the, the stakeholder participants um, looking at knowledge about and need for uh, an ASO program. Um, I, and I encourage you to look for this report when it comes out soon. Uh, one I'd like to highlight is this question, what would more accurate measurements of snow volume and location add to your work? Um, and lots of, uh, lots of interesting potential applications in our stakeholders' eyes, um, but um, the confidence in seasonal planning, optimizing of water decisions, and confidence in seasonal runoff forecasts is really, really the highest um, interest there. And toward that end, um, we're working with the operational agencies uh, and entities to get these data into forecast models. A couple examples here working with this, the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center um, to get the data into, uh, into their model. Uh, and I mentioned earlier the partnership with NCAR uh, and the Wharf Hydro Forecasting System uh, to get data into that system uh, and, uh, and improve their um, ensemble streamflow prediction efforts there. So, that's a presentation unto itself, so I'll skip through that right now, but it's really, I think, important to take these data um, from just a SWE inventory and albedo inventory and get them into that forecasting context. Um, so really that, that linkage between observation uh, and, and operational forecasting is part of this vision for um, working with uh, with existing and future partners to build out next generate what we call next generation water management that's adding to the existing systems um, as i mentioned early on uh, really we're, we are putting the existing monitoring systems uh, like like snowtel to work in different ways we depend on those for ground validation as also and also for density measurements um, so not relying on them for the period of record comparison but relying on them for their temporal continuity um, and high measurement rate and high accuracy uh, at all of those locations. Um, so we are strong advocates for not only maintaining but expanding those networks um, and really within this vision of, of bringing in satellite uh, airborne and ground-based measurements uh, and, and really providing the best monitoring network um, to enable our experienced forecast teams to provide the best forecast possible. Um, I'll toss it over to Eric here to talk about uh, how we're envisioning uh, the, the future uh, looking forward here. Thanks, Jeff. So yeah, I'm just gonna tidy this all up and wrap it up with how we're looking moving forward with this chasm group. So really it comes back to Colorado's water plan, right? We have this recognition that data is the foundation of all decision-making. And so we really see this ASO data and this CHASM effort as another tool to add to other amazing data sources, such as the NRCS Snowtel network. This really is meant to just provide the stakeholders another option to use in concert with pre-existing stuff so that they can really refine down what is available in their basins and get down to that nitty gritty of what we need to do this water year based on what we have. And Jeff mentioned that really great stakeholder engagement, right? So we've had just about over a hundred folks participating in these monthly chasm stakeholder meetings. And that is ever growing. And it's not only folks in the state of Colorado, but we're starting to work more with folks outside of the state. So we've got some folks in New Mexico who are starting to join these calls. The Upper Colorado River Commission is starting to get some serious interest in this program. So there's a lot of opportunity to work with folks within the state and outside of the state with this new data source. But as with everything, it comes down to funding. You know, you can only have as much fun as you can afford. And this is opening up some opportunities for um, some new funding partnerships. 
both through local, state, and federal sources, but it's also kind of revealing to us that we need to use everything we possibly can, all of the local stakeholders, all of the state agencies we possibly can, and all of the federal agencies we possibly can to fully fund out a program. You know, you can see this map here, and all this green is what we're potentially looking to expand this program to, to truly make it a statewide program. And that could cost anywhere between nine to $14 million a year. Um, last year for one year 2022, we were able to get $2.6 million through local match and state funding. Now that's not a whole lot. You can see those blue basins there, you know, it's, it's great data and we were able to cover quite a few areas, but there's a lot more work ahead of us. And that includes federal collaboration, trying to strengthen our partnerships. You know, I mentioned NRCS earlier, and they're absolutely the backbone of everything we do when it comes down to snow measurement. So strengthening our relationship with Brian, Carl, and their team through this process and trying to figure out, okay, are there ways that we can help you with your network based on the snow data that we're seeing here? Are there ways that we can work together to make this a more robust program? Um, I also want to highlight the Bureau of Reclamation, for example. So with the Dolores flights that we were doing this year, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation has been using that data on the operational side for Navajo Reservoir, but they're also using it in an experimental capacity with the Colorado River Basin Forecast Center. Um, that They've only done a few runs with that, and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done there, but that's an exciting prospect as well, is feeding this high-resolution data into that particular forecast that is that has multiple state implications. Um, finally, we're trying to really refine what the stakeholders need in terms of modeling, right? We're trying to really figure out exactly how this data can be used, whether that's through NCARS Wharf Hydro, the CBRFC, or stakeholders' own individual modeling efforts. And we're just really excited about continuing this program and really getting it built out. And that is all I had. Just wanted to keep it short and sweet for you guys. Great, thank you both so much. I'm sorry that we're running um, over today, but I really appreciate you jumping on and sharing with us um, some of the cool work that's going on. Um, as Eric just mentioned, really excited about the possibility of <clears throat> adding this data set to all the great data that we already have in the state. Um, it's, we're already at time, so I'm sorry that we won't have time for um, some report outs around the state. Um, I did just want to mention quickly <clears throat> um, a reminder that I received from Joel um, Schneekloff from CSU that this weekend snow forecast, although it's exciting for the headwaters and some of um, our uh, snow forecasts um, for a lot of the ag producers, it's actually, um, as according to Joel, he's saying it's adding insult to injury um, because they've been dealing with the drought and now this will mean a late freeze. Um, so we'll really be an impact to the winter wheat um, that has survived the drought so far. So although the, the precip um, and the snow coming this weekend is good news for some. Um, it's hard news for, for others. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, everyone else, I if you have an observation you'd like to share, please feel free to put it in chat. I'll leave the meeting open for a little while um, so folks can add uh, local observations. And I also wanted to mention, again, our next meeting will be June 28th. Um, in person at the Colorado um, Parks and Wildlife Headquarters. We'll send out the specific address for that. Um, it will be hybrid. So if you can't join us in person, we look forward to seeing you online then. And um, I think that's it. Thanks again to Eric and Jeff, Brian and Russ for presenting to us today. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, like I said, I'll go ahead and keep the keep the chat open for a little while for those who can stay. Or if you'd like to go off mute and uh, ask a question or anything, I'll, I can hang around for a little bit as well. <clears throat> Thanks, Megan. I can stick on for a few minutes here as well if anyone has a okay. question. Great. 
Yeah, I'm looking for Joel's last name at CSU. Yes, Marianne, I was just going to respond um, and send it to you in the chat. So hold on just a minute. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. That's good information, although it's bad information. But yes, sure I know. It's definitely good to remember that this late, um, the late precipitation, unfortunately, has a has a dark side for some. Okay. There you go, Marian. I just um, sent his uh, CSU page to you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Much sure. appreciated. Yep. No problem. <clears throat> Jeff, there's a question that came in for you at the chat. Steve Hunter is wondering when you're planning on flying the Roaring Fork. Yeah, thanks, Steve. We're planning to um, get the snow-free data for the Roaring Fork um, and Frying Pan and Upper Arkansas systems um, this summer. So that would enable flights for water year 23 uh, in there. So we'd love to tag up with you on that. Another question about the Fraser River Basin. Well, yeah, we're flying the Fraser this year. So that's part of the Windy Gap, Colorado Windy Gap domain. Um, I, I didn't call out all the sub basins in my haste to get through too many slides. Um, so we're flying the Fraser twice this year with support from the USGS, uh, who is working up there uh, as part of their next generation water observing system activities. Uh, so thanks to the USGS for that. Um, and we're looking uh, to repeat that next year um, again with them as partners. So two flights this year. Second one would be upcoming yet, um, certainly after the incoming storm, uh, whenever we get the next weather window. And if um, people are interested in joining those stakeholder calls, can they sign up for those on coloradosnow.org? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Great. Sorry, Eric, I stepped on you there. No worries. All right, any uh, final questions? Comments, thoughts? Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks again to our presenters and we'll look forward to seeing everyone in June. Stay healthy, everybody. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, all. Bye, guys.